from historic and dense forest preserves where it said ghosts resulting from murders committed long ago still roam to sprawling natural areas whose grounds play home to phantom loggers and much darker things. Are you ready for the most haunted hikes in Oregon? Number 5. Scoponia Recreation Site Scoponia Recreation Site, located about 13 miles west of Scopus, Oregon, on the banks of the Nehalem River off Scopus Vernonia Road, is a recreational zone featuring seven miles of natural parkland that sits in a region renowned amongst hikers, hunters, and nature enthusiasts alike. Initially, land holding the site played home to a native village called Scapus, with fur trader Thomas McKay arriving in 1832 and setting up a farm nearby on the Scapus Plains. When McKay passed on in 1849, he was actually buried at this very farm. Through the 1850s, more settlers began arriving to the Scapus area, and in 1874, one Clark Parker settled on land now known as Vernonia, followed closely in 1875 by the Van Blaricum family. Through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the strip of land between the two towns attracted attention from a number of logging operations. In 1891, Vernonia was officially incorporated, with Scapus following later in 1921. Through the 1950s, as logging efforts slowed, this same land was transformed into a park, and eventually the old logging roads were modified into fresh hiking paths. Today, this historic land contains Scaponia County Park and offers a range of trails, picnic areas, restrooms, fresh drinking water, and a small tent campground that operates on a first-come, first-serve basis. Scaponia Recreation Site plays home to one particularly dark local legend, telling that in the mid to late 1800s, a horse thief lived on site with his dog. As the story goes, after a life of stealing and reselling horses across Oregon, the townspeople caught on to his racket. They formed a mob, surprised him at his home, and hanged him while shooting his dog dead, later burying both bodies unceremoniously on the property. Some versions of this tale go so far as to claim the townspeople finished this execution by setting fire to and raising the thief's house. The ghostly figures of both the man and his dog have been sighted wandering and playing along Scaponia trails, and additionally, the sounds of the thief calling out commands to his faithful companion are often heard from just out of sight. Several more disturbing accounts tell of the disembodied sounds of the mob, the sounds of the dog barking frantically, and of a lone gunshot followed by silence. And many have described the phantom sensation of an unseen rope closing in around their necks. Lastly, many parkgoers report the constant feeling of being watched or followed, of never truly being alone, or for that matter, safe. Number 4. Tryon Creek State Natural Area Tryon Creek State Natural Area, located off Southwest Terwilliker Boulevard, about 15 minutes from downtown Portland, Oregon, and sharing a border with Lake Oswego, is a second growth forest spanning 645 acres that boasts the title of being Oregon's only state park smack dab in the middle of a major metropolitan area. The park's history begins in 1850 when pioneer physician Socrates Hotchkiss Tryon Sr along with his wife Frances and son, moved to the Oregon Territory. Tryon Sr. was one of the first physicians in Oregon and soon settled onto what would eventually become Parkland. In 1852, Tryon Sr. and Francis would welcome a daughter into the world, though sadly in 1855, Sr. would pass away. His wife and children would continue to reside at the home until 1874, after which they would sell the property to the Oregon Iron Company. This land was logged heavily until 1969, when a portion of the old grounds was purchased by Multnomah County for the purpose of creating a new park. In 1970, more surrounding land was added to this park, and in 1975, its name was officially changed to Tryon Creek State Natural Area. Tryon Sr.'s old home stood for a while until its demolition through the 1990s, before which it was actually the only residence in the city of Portland to remain on its original land claim. 
Today, Tryon Creek remains open to the public, offering over eight miles of hiking trails, eight bridges, a boardwalk over wetland, and biking and equestrian trails. And the Oregon Iron Company's old logging paths have breathed new life into this system in the form of the Old Iron Mountain Trail. One of the most famous legends surrounding the park tells that early in the morning, often just before big storms, one can hear the sounds of hooves and whinnying down the trail, as well as the disembodied voices of men conversing seemingly as they're headed off to work. This phenomena is thought to be the work of restless spirits of former loggers, and while records kept are scarce, taking the dangerous nature of logging work into account, it's assumed a fair number may have died in these very woods. Reported all throughout Tryon are extreme cold spots, orbs and photographs, the sounds of axes chopping and of orders being called out, and the smell of freshly cut wood when there's none present. Vehicles through the area commonly refuse to start, cell phone batteries die at abnormal rates, and personal possessions have been known to disappear and reappear later in strange places. Lastly, several accounts tell of shadowy figures that stalk park grounds after dark, and a host of full-bodied apparitions in old-fashioned clothing. Number 3. Malheur Butte Malheur Butte, along the banks of the Malheur River off Highway 20 between Ontario and Vail, Oregon, is an extinct volcanic structure rising 500 feet above surrounding farmland that claims the title of being the most distinctive natural landmark in the area. Incidentally, this butte is located right along the Oregon Trail and has historically been utilized as a navigational aid and vantage point both by native peoples and by those traveling west. And through through the early 1840s, it offered an excellent view from which to monitor wagon trains entering the territory. The incline was originally called Kennedy Butte and took its name from a pioneer who had homesteaded at its base. Land that Vale now sits on once played home to several small native tribes and was actually the first stop in Oregon Territory, with journeys from early travelers mentioning the Malheur River and the welcome comfort of the area's natural hot springs at which they could rest, bathe, and wash their clothes. By as early as 1853, a formal trading post had been established, and by 1883, Vail boasted its very own post office. Although the Butte has been inactive for millions of years, scientific observation of the area has revealed ongoing geothermal activity, the same activity resulting in its impressive hot springs. Today, energy provided by thermals has been harnessed and repurposed by Oregon Trail mushrooms at their Vale processing plant, while more recent efforts have been launched to utilize this energy in other beneficial ways. Land surrounding the Butte is privately owned, so if you want to check this one out, you'll have to pay close attention to signs as not to cross any unmarked boundaries. Sadly, many lost their lives while traversing the Oregon Trail, some never even reaching or seeing the Butte, which was a telltale sign they were closing in on their destination. And even into recent times, remains have been unearthed throughout the area. Disturbingly, Malheur is also said to be a spot where witch covens and darker practices once met in seclusion, and rumors of human sacrifice and portals to demonic realms are common in local legend. Many hiking the Butte have reported disembodied voices heard emanating from thin air, shadowy figures that stalk lone walkers, and a range of full-bodied apparitions in clothing or uniforms spanning the ages. Those who have attempted to camp the area often report hearing something inhuman roaming around their sights in the middle of the night, with several chilling accounts telling of tents being moved, messed with, or even dragged sizable distances with their occupants still inside, and unidentifiable tracks found the following day. Also reported across Malheur are disembodied footsteps, a general feeling of unease, and inexplicable sagebrush fires that kick up out of nowhere. Lastly, tales tell of demonic, shadowy creatures that stalk the butte after dark. Some describe them as imp-like in appearance, while others claim they resemble mutated dogs. Whatever the case, nearly all encounters with said creatures end in those present being chased from the area, or even attacked. Number 2. Forest Park 
Forest Park, located in the Tualatin Mountains west of downtown Portland, is a public municipal park spanning more than 5,100 acres, which is stretched into an eight-mile strip that contains several smaller parks within its expanse and is one of the largest urban forest preserves in the United States. Before settlers arrived to the area, it was covered in dense fir forests, but by 1855 had been divided into donation land claims, with residents utilizing its wood reserves to further build and expand. Following early logging efforts, the zone's steep slopes began to crumble, resulting in landslides that destroyed most planned or in-progress construction, and many of the donated land claims were defaulted upon or given back to the city entirely. In 1897, businessman Donald McClee would donate 105 acres to the creation of McClee Park, an outdoor space designed to accommodate hospital patients. And in 1899, the Municipal Park Commission of Portland was formed in an effort to better manage local parklands. Grounds used in the creation of Forest Park as a whole were acquired slowly through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and through the 1930s and the Great Depression, workers with federal relief programs would construct a ranger station and public restroom. Sadly, this building was later vandalized, damaged in a storm, and was then partially dismantled through the 1960s. Its remnants now often referred to as the Stone House, or more commonly and infamously as the Witch's Castle. Today, Forest Park holds more than 70 miles of trails and fire lines within its boundaries, including a portion of the Wildwood Trail, a formidable 40-mile loop cutting through the Portland metro area. Although the entirety of the park's zone is referred to as Forest Park, many smaller parks contained within retain their independent names and boundaries. The most famous legend born at Forest Park surrounds the Witch's Castle, and tells that land itself sits on was once owned by Danford Balch, after whom Balch Creek takes its name. In 1850, after moving to Portland with his wife Mary Jane and their nine children, Balch filed a land claim, and quickly set to work clearing his plot with the help of a young man named Mortimer Stump, whose family had settled nearby. As Balch and Stump worked together, it's said that Mortimer fell in love with Balch's 15-year-old daughter, Anna, and that eventually the couple asked for Balch's blessing. Unfortunately, it's said that Balch refused to give it to them and threatened if Stump wouldn't leave the matter alone that he would kill him. This threat resulted in Anna and Mortimer running away to Vancouver to elope. A few weeks after their marriage, while the couple was in Portland for supplies, they encountered an enraged Balch, who many claimed was waiting for them. Balch was armed with a shotgun, and without a moment's hesitation, shot Stump dead as he, Anna, and her parents attempted to board the Stark Street Ferry in order to cross the Willamette. When Balch was confronted, he made a range of insane claims, including that his wife had bewitched him into committing the shooting to force their daughter home. Balch was arrested but would escape back to the forest for a time before he was reapprehended by City Marshal James Lapius, and in 1859 he would go on to become the first person legally hanged within city limits. Many claim paranormal activity at the Witch's Castle is a direct result of the restless spirits of both Balch and Stump, forced to work together and to feud for all eternity. With many entering the area reporting extreme cold spots, the constant feeling of being watched or followed, and orbs that are both visible to the naked eye and that also appear in the backgrounds of photographs. Other more recent stories tell the castle once played home to a witch's coven or a satanic cult and that it might contain a portal to hell. Reported throughout Forest Park and confined to no area in particular are the disembodied sounds of children crying, otherworldly noises heard from high in the treetops, voices from thin air, and a general feeling of unease or anxiety. A wide spectrum of crimes, including murders, have occurred on park grounds, and in 1999, Todd Allen Reed, also known as the Forest Park Killer and whom remains in prison to this day, left the bodies of three of his victims within its expanse. Lastly, a number of accounts tell of the sighting of full-bodied apparitions that materialize for only seconds amongst the trees before vanishing entirely, and shadowy silhouettes have been known to watch or even stalk lone park-goers at great lengths.
Number one, Multnomah Falls. Multnomah Falls, located on Multnomah Creek in the Columbia River Gorge, east of Troutdale and between Corbett and Dodson in Multnomah County, Oregon, is a 620-foot-tall waterfall boasting its mantle as the tallest waterfall in the state, as well as its reputation as being the most visited natural recreation area in the whole of the Pacific Northwest. Beginning in 1884, the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company would establish a stop at Multnomah Falls on a line that ran from Portland, Oregon to Pasco, Washington. Shortly after, they would construct a bowstring truss bridge, which actually sat where our more modern bridge does today. In 1891, the original bridge was reinforced but was later dismantled in 1899. In 1915, planning followed by fundraising for a new trail was started. The same year, one Simon Benson funded the construction of a new stonemason's footbridge, resulting in the U.S. Forest Service being contracted to establish a trail and lookout. In 1925, the Multnomah Falls Lodge was completed, utilizing native split fieldstone, which was laid irregularly, and was intended to prove shelter and hot meals to those traveling through the area. In 1981, the Multnomah Falls Lodge, along with its footpaths, were added to the National Register of Historic Places. Sadly, in 1991, the falls and surrounding land were devastated by a large fire, which fortunately stopped just short of hitting the lodge. Today, the lodge acts as a tourist attraction, interpretive center, diner, and gift shop. The falls, a designated scenic area, are accessible via Interstate 84 and offer a paved foot trail that leads directly to the Benson footbridge as well as to the falls peak. Multnomah and its encompassing lands are surrounded by a range of legends, mostly native in origin. One tale tells of Coyote, one of the most powerful of the animals, who's described as a beast in some stories and as a man in others. It's said that long ago, when all people and all animals spoke the same language, Coyote fell in love with a beautiful woman and, wishing to marry her, presented her father with a large stack of furs. It said her father would not condone the purchase of his daughter, instead insisting that Coyote win her heart in the traditional manner. After pondering this request, Coyote asked the woman what she wanted most, and she answered water where she could relax and bathe in private. This legend furthers to tell that Coyote created Multnomah Falls from his love and the pool at the base for the woman that he desired. It said she was satisfied and the couple went on to live happily, until one day, two old women sat atop the tallest and nearest peak and spied on the couple's private pool, going on to spread rumors and insults of their romance. The old women spoke of the couple in a way that caused everyone to laugh, which resulted in the young woman's extreme distress. It said that one day she could no longer bear it and she left the pool, never to return. When Coyote realized she was gone, it said he tracked her in his canoe and eventually caught up with her as she was swimming out toward the big water where the sun hides. It said the couple's undying love transformed them into two little ducks that can still be seen together playing on the water to this very day. Another story surrounding the falls, or more accurately describing their formation, comes from an old Wasco legend. It tells that many years ago, a head chief to the Multnomah people had a beautiful daughter that was especially important to him due to the fact that he'd lost all of his sons at war. Eventually, and with care and consideration, he chose her the perfect husband, a brave warrior from the neighboring Clatsup people. The two tribes gathered for celebrations and feasting that was said to last for several days. Sadly, before ceremonies could conclude, a sickness ravaged the tribes, taking children and the elderly first, and even stronger younger men later. As the wailing of the women in the tribes echoed through the forests, one old medicine man revealed that a sacrifice would have to be made to the Great Spirit, one of purity and of innocence, but also of a chief's bloodline. He told that a young woman would have to throw herself from the high cliffs above the big river onto the rocks below. Unwilling to sacrifice any one of the dozens of girls who could have fit this request, the tribes chose instead to suffer bravely through the illness. 
Days passed, and more grew sick and died, until finally the young, brave Clatsop warrior became ill. His new bride, noting his decline, slipped away in the middle of the night. Not telling anyone of her plan, she followed the trail to the Great River and reached the edge of a cliff overlooking the waters below. As she gazed upon this view, she asked for a sign that her people would be spared, and just as she did, the moon rose full and bright into the sky. She accepted her sign, closed her eyes, and jumped from the cliffs. The next morning, miraculously, the tribes awoke healthy and strong, free of all symptoms. Curious as to why this had occurred, the head Multnomah chief beckoned all present daughters and granddaughters of head men and found that only his was missing. The brave Clatsop warrior sprinted to the cliffs and tragically discovered the body of his beloved on the rocks below. It said the tribe buried her right where she fell, next to the water, as a hero and savior. As they proceeded, the chief asked for a sign that his daughter's soul had been welcomed into the land of the spirits. And just as he did, water came crashing over the cliffs to form Multnomah Falls. To this day, many report sighting the young woman's spirit around the pool, usually in the early mornings or late at night, and dressed entirely in white. Witnesses often note her as staring up at the cliff from which she jumped for a short time before fading into nothingness and leaving a chill in her wake. Also reported throughout the Multnomah Falls area are the disembodied sounds of native singing, drums and voices, orbs and strange mists visible to the naked eye, and the constant feeling of being closely watched, albeit not in a sinister way, but more in a protective sense. With its ridiculously fascinating history, long list of simply amazing native legends, and slew of associated supernatural encounters and ghost stories, we felt Multnomah Falls was a pretty logical choice as our pick for the most haunted hike in Oregon. Thank you all for tuning in to our list of picks for the most haunted hikes in Oregon. If you enjoyed hearing our histories and ghost stories as much as we enjoyed telling them to you, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and turn notifications on so you get alerts when fresh content is on the way. Throw us a like if you feel we've earned it, and most importantly, share this video and our channel with anyone you think deserves a good scare. We'll catch you all next time.